And then uh, around 2001, you start to see or hear that that sound has kind of mutated uh, again, and you start to see the emergence of breakcore, right? You start to see the emergence of breakcore, breakbeat hardcore, and you start to see or hear. Th I mean, this is this coincides almost exactly with the emergence of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, right? That's like at exactly the same time that that becomes a mass phenomenon. You start to have this figure, which people still sometimes talk about, who is called the bedroom producer, right? There's some dork somewhere. Uh, who maybe was involved in the kind of whole rave thing, or maybe wasn't actually, like maybe like his big brother was, and it usually is like a his. But anyway, uh, sounds like this uh, start to become, we start to get to hear uh, sounds like this. <laughs> kind of tell, like it's kind of getting um, heavier, right? It gets heavier, it becomes, it's kind of like a, a heavy, uh, heavy metal, right? It's kind of like the heavy metal of, uh, of electronic music. So, um, uh, I think that this is, it's worth, it's worth thinking about the, the Amen and the kind of work that the Amen does. Because the Amen's kind of history, the Amen's trajectory through uh, through history, the kind of biography of the breakbeat, uh, this is a piece of sound. This was recorded at a place and at a time, right, by a person, right, uh, by an African-American man, right, by a black man. This is a sound of the work, the labor, the physical labor, right, uh, of a black man, right. And in Western culture more broadly, uh, th there's a certain kind of history for this. Right, and that's a history that's kind of important and that we can't um, overlook, right? Because uh, maybe this is kind of an old-fashioned argument to make, but this guy, I mean, the, the man, the drummer, Gregory Coleman, is deceased. Uh, he's dead, but he didn't get any money. He didn't get a penny, yeah? Like, uh, you know, he walked into the studio. He got paid that day. Uh, he laid out this breakbeat, and uh, then he walked away. He, he never saw any of the money for anything that came after that. And as I understand it, you know, there are kind of reports where actually he wasn't happy about that. He was like, you know, why didn't I, all of these people, all these other people profited from what I did. I didn't get any money out of that. Is that fair? You know? And so, and we're, you know, sometimes we're going, oh, wow, isn't it awesome? You know, like, look now, anybody can do this. People are like sampling stuff. And, and, but this sample is utterly canonical, you know, utterly canonical and is embedded in, in like, you can use it. One of the things you can do with it is that you can draw out actually these histories of, uh, you know, national identity and ethnic identity and gender identity, right? And these kinds of ideas about, you know, I mean, one of the things that's funny about percussion is that um, percussion is in a way quite, quite masculine or quite natural. The drums are kind of coded as a male, uh, as a male instrument, 
So there's something kind of interesting about that, about, uh, you know, once you have kind of bedroom production, you have basically like uh, white guys, right, who are using this sample, which happens to be a recording of a, a black uh, percussionist, uh, to do to as a kind of expressive form, right? And um, in a weird way, this kind of leisure practice actually tells you something about work, yeah? It tells you something about, uh, you know, like these, uh, the computers that are used to do this kind of, kind of work, uh, I mean, it is a kind of work, right? Uh, it's not very easy, actually. Sequencing uh, beats in this kind of way is quite time-consuming. You're likely to get, um, you know, you get sore, sore wrists moving the, the mouse around all the time. So, um, it's, in a weird way, it tells you something about work, right? It also, in a similar way to the way in which it tells you something about relationships between work and leisure, or between uh, white men and black men, uh, it tells you something about copyright. It tells you something about the limits of copyright as a productive way of handling, if you, know, if you want to have an idea like intellectual property, whatever you want to call this cultural stuff, uh, we l l see something about uh, copyright, and one of the things some people talk about when they talk about things like breakbeats is they talk about ideas around the commons, right, where we might say, oh, uh, it's interesting, uh, different um, social groups with different kinds of histories, so for example, African American people with the, the history that they have in the United States, uh, different groups of people with different kinds of cultural histories, with different kinds of cultural products that they produce, might be approaching those products in different kinds of ways. So where we might be used to, or we might be well versed in thinking about intellectual property as a thing which is said to belong to a particular person, if a person maybe writes a tune, somehow it kind of belongs to them, there are ideas in play where other people say, actually, you know, culture is a living form. You know, uh, a song is not a piece of property. Uh, that's not how songs work. That's not really how culture works. That's not really how, um, how music uh, works, right? So, and, and that's, I think, uh, a, thing to, a thing to think about.